welcome to another session ID to IPO. Silicon Valley, we're doing a presentation today on how to do a venture capital financing. My name is Ali Dadvakili. I'm an attorney with Foley and Lardner. I know people are still joining, so it's just nine o'clock now. I thought we'd give it another minute or so, and then we can uh, get going. So um, appreciate the patience, but let's give it another another minute and we will uh, go ahead and uh, dive into the topic of how to do venture capital financing. For those of you that are already in and waiting, there will be a link that will be circulated probably a, a couple of days after this presentation. We'll, we need to kind of go through and, and prep it and then what we'll do is we'll send the link out. So if you need to leave a little bit early or if you join late and didn't get a chance to see the full video, uh, no fears, no worries. You will definitely get a opportunity to view the link um, once we have it ready and sent back out to you. It okay, looks like we got a few more people joining, so let's give it another 30 seconds and then we can go ahead and get started. I know in the past when I've done these, there have been people that have joined from all over the globe, including Asia, Australia, South America, Africa. So for those of you in different time zones where it's either super early in the morning or late at night, I uh, really appreciate your taking the time to, um, to attend. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? It's uh, a little after nine. Uh, my name is Ali Dadvakili. I'm an attorney with Foley and Lardner. We are going to be talking today about how to do a venture capital financing. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'll give you a little background on myself and uh, Foley and Lardner. We'll discuss the agenda and then we'll dive into some topics, hopefully of, of interest to all of you. Uh, next slide, please. So very quick housekeeping matter. Just keep in mind, I'm going to be talking sort of very high level about concepts and issues that come up when a company is going to be doing a venture capital financing. So please don't take anything that I say as legal advice. It's not intended to be legal advice. It's really more educational. This is an educational program. I am happy to uh, talk to you or correspond with you via email. If you've got some specific questions after this program, I will include my email uh, on the uh, last page. So you'll have that to look at. Um, reach out to me if you've got any specific questions. But um, I won't be discussing any specific uh, fact issues today that you might have, just sort of general general information. Next slide, please. So here's our agenda for today. We've got a lot of material. It's, it's pretty packed. I'll try to get through it as quickly as I can and leave room for some Q&A at the end. We've gotten some great questions in the past. If there's something that I covered that you want to delve into a little bit more, you had questions about, or if it wasn't clear, please ask. You can put it in the chat. You know, because this is a webinar and um, we're trying to squeeze everything in within the hour and a half that we have, I'll try to save as many of the questions for the end as I can, and then I'll run through the questions. I, I will be checking them as they come in. So if I can handle a couple as I'm talking on a particular topic, I'll certainly try to do that. But if uh, you could bear with me, uh, I will try to get to all the questions at the very end. If there's some that I don't get to because we run out of time, uh, just reach out to me separately. Send me an email. I'd be happy to chat with you. So I'll give you a little bit of background. We'll talk about sort of overview of, of the discussion for today, some structural considerations of you know what you set up, where you set it up, if you're setting up your company, important documentation in the very beginning stages of your company for founders and early personnel to be thinking about. What are some of the financing options that are available before you do your, your actual VC financing? For example, we'll talk a little bit about uh, convertible securities, We'll talk a little bit about valuation and, and dilution and why that's important to be thinking about as you're going through this process. We'll provide an overview of the venture capital financing and then getting ready for getting investment ready, as I call it. So putting yourself in the best position possible before you even start talking to investors and then how to prepare for closing. And some common pitfalls that I've seen over the years where startups, founders, entrepreneurs can can miss make some missteps and create some issues for themselves that they might otherwise be able to avoid. And then we'll have our Q&A. Next slide, please. OK, so a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a corporate attorney with uh, Foley and Lardner. My practice is focused primarily on working with emerging growth and venture capital um, investors. Uh, it's everything from startup of formation of the company all the way through exit. So once we get to some sort of M&A or, or exit, then help them with that as well. 
and everything in between, including helping them raise financing, all the corporate governance related issues um, and things like that that come with it. I work out of our San Francisco and Silicon Valley offices. I've worked with companies that have been local to the Silicon Valley area, as well as San Francisco, other parts of the US, as well as other parts of the world. A lot of companies coming into the US have done a lot of cross-border work where we'll help set them up and provide them with a, a operational company here in the US. Love working with entrepreneurs and founders and investors. The startup adventure is, is really a great adventure. It's one that takes a, a ton of time and commitment, persistence, but it's one that obviously has tremendous payoff, um, both you know personally, professionally. It can be very rewarding for the founders once they hit a home run and have a really successful exit. And it's also, it leads to all this incredible innovation that we have today. And it's, it's a lot of that is because of all of you folks, you know, you founders, entrepreneurs, as well as the investors that are supporting all these endeavors. Um, so it's great to play a small part in that and see all the cool stuff that you guys are developing and doing. Next slide, please. Hey, I, I like to throw in quotes every once in a while because they can, you know, these famous quotes can say things that I could never say in so few words. So we'll focus a little bit on this throughout today's discussion, but preparation is key. I, I talk about this almost in every single presentation I give on, on this or related topics that, you know, the more time you spend on preparing for whatever it is, including the financing, the better it will be, the more successful it will be, the cheaper it will be, the quicker it will be. So I can't overemphasize how important the preparation piece is to uh, a successful transaction. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about Foley and Larger. Great firm, been around a long time. I think we we date back to the 1880s or so. So very long history. We are a national, international law firm. Uh, we do basically a full service, everything from corporate to executive comp, executive benefits, to IP, litigation, tax, uh, environmental, energy. I mean, you name it. There's, there's just about nothing we don't do. And we've divided our practice areas in, into a number of different sections. So we focus a lot on different areas that are important to our clients, like technology, healthcare, life sciences, energy. We have about 25 offices across the, the US and several offices outside the US as well. The next slide, please. And so you can see a little bit here very quickly on some of the different topics that we cover. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just the takeaway here is it's really full service. So if you've got questions about anything, not just corporate, feel free to reach out to me. If it's something that we can help you with, I will make sure to get you to the right person and, and uh, help you guys out however we can. Next slide, please. Okay, so so delving into the, the, the meat of this discussion, one of the first issues to consider as, as you're sort of preparing to do a, a VC financing is you've got to make sure you've got the right entity and that it's set up and it's set up in the right place. So the two main decision points early on in, in the startup adventure is what type of entity should I create and where should I create it? What jurisdiction should I be using? I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I can go into some more detail if people have specific questions. But essentially, when you're looking at getting investment dollars from, from third parties, i.e. angels, but really specifically looking at sort of the venture capital investors, private equity investors, the more sophisticated investors, they oftentimes want or will require that you set up your entity as a Delaware C corporation. Delaware, because Delaware is sort of the preeminent state in the US where a lot of the companies, the majority of publicly traded companies in the US are all set up as Delaware corporations. And any company that wants to attract VC dollars, if you're setting it up in the US, you really should be looking at setting it up in Delaware. Delaware has a, a, a great statute. It's reviewed on a regular basis. It's updated. It's, it's very well written. There's a lot of time and effort put into developing and creating a corporate corporation's code that's well written, that sort of balances the management side and the investor side. Very well understood and respected by a lot of the investors, as well as uh, a lot of the companies. So that's one reason. The Delaware is a little bit unique in the, in the sense that if there's ever a dispute that arises with regard to the corporation, then there is a special court in Delaware called the Chancery Court. And the judges that sit on that court and who will be deciding those cases are all very steeped in business law um, knowledge. They, they usually have practiced business law before coming onto the bench, and that's all they do. They don't do other areas of law that doesn't relate to, to business or corporate law. So you usually have your case decided by someone with a tremendous amount of experience in that specific area. So that's another great reason. They're also very, the, the Secretary of State is very responsive. 
So you can turn around things pretty quickly, easy to work with them. So for those and a number of other reasons, Delaware is sort of the preeminent state. The entity type being a Delaware C Corp, the, the corporate form is the oldest oldest form entity form. You know, when you're looking at a form that can provide you with some liability protection, it's very well known. It goes back. We've got a good, you know, long 200 year history or so in the U.S. So it's very well understood that the way it's set out in the statute is 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 understood as well by the investors. So it's it's a structure and entity that investors like. They understand it. They're they're knowledgeable about it. And oftentimes will require that to be the the structure that you set up. Next slide, please. Oh, and just really quickly for those of you, I get this question all the time. Um, if you're joining or join late, then a couple of things. One, this this is being recorded, so we'll make the recording available to you afterwards. It may take a couple of days, but we'll get it out to everyone that registered for this uh, presentation. So you'll have a chance to to view the recording if you didn't view it or if you came in late or need to leave a little bit early. So don't worry, it will be available for you. The other topic that's really important as you're looking to set yourself up and, and to do a, a VC financing, and, and this applies to any kind of financing really, but I know that today's topic is really focused on VC financing, is documentation for founders and early personnel. So your, your very early documentation with regards to your company is, is really critical. That's sort of the foundation. If, if you do it properly, consistently, then you've set everything up the right way from the get-go, and it's very easy to maintain that process going forward. Because as the company grows and expands and, and scales, you'll have a lot more documents, you'll have more financing rounds, but setting everything up, having the right documentation in place early on is going to be really, really important. Yeah, so I just saw a question. We will definitely share the recording. It will be made available uh, probably in a few days after this uh, presentation. So on the topic of the early documentation, so I mentioned it's key. You want to make sure that you've got in place, the company has in place a, a number of different agreements, but those should cover confidentiality. So um, if the founders are going to be talking to anyone that they want to maybe bring into the company as an advisor, an employee, consultant, maybe even early discussions with who might be potential customers. You just want to make sure that you've you've covered whatever sensitive information you may be disclosing. You want to make sure you've got some sort of confidentiality agreement in place to cover that. Now, one thing I'll, I'll note, when you're working with VCs and, and other investors, but especially VCs, don't ask them to sign a confidentiality agreement because they will not sign it. They see hundreds and hundreds of business plans and slide decks you know, on a monthly basis. And if they were to try to sign a, a confidentiality agreement on every one of those scenarios, they'd be dealing with tens of thousands of them over time and it's just impossible to manage. So they typically will refuse to sign a confidentiality agreement to, to have an initial meeting. You don't need to disclose the secret sauce at that initial meeting, but um, they, they typically will not be uh, um, signing any sort of confidentiality agreement. But anyone else you talk to certainly should be thinking about it and have one ready to go. The other agreement that's really important, and especially for founders, but also early employees, consultants, advisors, is what we refer to as an intellectual property assignment agreement. It's got a couple of different acronyms, CIIAA or PIIAA, which stands for Confidential Information Invention Assignment Agreement. I know it's a mouthful. Or Proprietary Information Invention Assignment Agreement. Those cover confidentiality, but they also cover something really critical, which is if you've got someone that's coming into the company to develop something for you, to create something, to code the what's going to ultimately be the software that's going to run the platform or the company um, business, <clears throat> or they're they're creating something else that's got value that that's uh, going to create some IP, you want to make sure that that's all transferred over to the company so the company owns it. And the way to do that is by having one of these agreements in place. So it says essentially whatever they're doing that relates to the company is going to belong to the company. So if they you bring in a developer and they're they're writing the code that's going to be sort of your main code for running a bunch of applications that are going to be critical to the company's success, you want to make sure that you own that code. I, I'll talk about this when we get to the pitfalls, but one big pitfall is not getting that agreement in place early on. You get someone in that develops something critical, critical technology. You never got him or her to assign it to the company. They end up leaving a few months later after they've created it. Well, guess what? If you don't have it transferred over to the company and you've got no documentation to that effect, they own it. If they created it, they own it. And now you've got someone who basically owns the, the really valuable core technology you've created and you're stuck. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. 
Another issue to, to cover is vesting of securities. So <clears throat> when you talk about securities, you know, stock or options, you want to make sure that you've properly incentivized people that are going to be joining the company to work for you, but that you've also got uh, mechanisms in place so that if for someone, if for some reason someone leaves, you've got a way to repurchase the stock that has invested. It vests, it vests over time, so they've got to put in their time before they can take full advantage of the equity um, that they're getting. And that's one one mechanism to do that. It's very it's it's important for founders too. And and the reason being is you know if you've got more than one founder. And one of the founders decides to leave and they've got 40 percent or even, let's say, 50 percent of the company initially. Now they've left. They're no longer participating in helping the company grow, but they walk away with 50 percent of the company. That's huge. So that puts you in a potential stalemate position with decisions that owners might have to make because now they're 50 percent of, of any vote that you need to make. And if you can't get them to agree, then the company's in a stalemate. It's going to you know, be unable to, to move forward. Even if they have a smaller percentage, if it's significant, then there is no value that they're providing to the company going forward. So those are sort of issues that are all important to be thinking about on a going forward basis. And it's important from the investor's perspective because they will be looking for all of these things. They will be looking to make sure that you've got all of your IP assignment agreements in place with everyone, that if the stock has been issued or you've you've um, granted warrants or, or options to people, that the right language is in the agreement, so it is vesting over time, including vesting for founders. Um, even though if you're the founder, it's your brainchild, you've created it, why should you have restricted stock? Why should you have any of this vesting concept? Because the investors also want to know that when they put money into the company, that you're going to stick around. You're not going to take the money, goes into the company, and then you're like, oh, great, I'm going to take off and I'm going to go do something else. Because Without you, if you're the founder and you're the one that created this, uh, it's probably not going to be a successful venture and their money is going to be at risk. Transfer restrictions is another really important issue to be thinking about early on and, and having the right documentation because you don't want someone to get stock in the company and then, you know, a few months later, go ahead and, and sell that stock or, or transfer that stock to somebody else who may not be interested in the company, isn't involved in the company, can't really contribute to the company. You know, leaving aside the fact that it's it's this is a private company we're talking about, so you got to comply with the securities laws. You can't just go and sell your stock to whoever you want. There's there's ways to do it to make sure you're complying with the securities laws, but you still want to have some restrictions on place so the company knows at any given time who the owners are, and not wanting to have shares sold to someone who may not be a good person, including, for example, someone wants to transfer their shares to a competitor. Well, great. Now you've got a competitor on your cap table that's an owner. Do they have access to certain information? Are they going to be able to find out what you're doing? Probably not a good scenario in some cases. But um, anyway, those are some reasons why transfer restrictions are important. And the documentation for that is really important as well. Next slide, please. OK, financing options. I'm going to cover this kind of quickly because I don't want to make sure we've provided enough time to really talk about setting your company up for a venture capital financing. But oftentimes before your first VC financing, which is typically when you sell preferred stock to a venture capital firm fund, you will oftentimes need to be funding it, you know, from the very get go. And, and so here are some different ways that you can do that. Obviously you can bootstrap it, which is where the founders come out of pocket and put money in themselves to cover the initial expenses of starting up the company. But beyond that, oftentimes you can go out and do convertible notes. Oftentimes they're called bridge notes if you're bridging to the next sort of financing or um, some other type of convertible security, which uh, may be a SAFE, which is an acronym for a simple agreement for future equity. And we'll talk a bit about that. And then, of course, you know, you can sell um, stock, which would be, you know, priced equity. And most of the time <clears throat> when you're selling stock uh, to investors, you're going to be selling preferred stock. In some cases, not very common, you'll sell uh, common stock to uh, people very early on. Um, usually not the best approach because as you sell common stock, you've now priced the common stock at whatever you sold it to the investor at, which is usually going to be higher than you would want if you're then going to be going in providing restricted stock to employees and advisors and consultants or granting options to purchase common stock. So you need there's some pricing issues you need to be careful and sensitive about so you don't kind of mess things up on that front. Um, but anyway, there's other 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 financing options we won't really go into grants, loans, typically not 
loans are not something a startup is going to be able to do because you you don't have revenue and you don't have assets typically where you could go get a loan. There may be some grants. I've certainly seen early stage startups that have some sort of cool technology and whether there's federal or state programs that provide grants to fund that type of innovation. And there are some, so there may be some funding sources from that or from private private uh, foundations, but we're not going to go into that. That's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next slide, please. So let's touch on on convertible securities for a moment. So, and by its name, it, it, it's exactly that. It's a security that will convert into something else at some point in time. <clears throat> so, oftentimes it'll it's uh, it converts to a future equity at a negotiated discount or some sort of um, valuation cap. We'll talk about at uh, a future qualified equity financing. So some financing that's going to take place in the future. The investors today are putting money in today with this idea that they're going to be able to convert into that security when you go and sell that security in the future. So some of the pros and cons. If you are issuing convertible securities like a, a convertible note or a safe, that some of the two of the more common type of convertible securities, that avoids having to value the stock. You don't need to come up with a value on the stock today because you're not issuing stock, you're not issuing selling stock today. You're only giving them a, a contractual right to get stock at a later date once you sell it. So, you know, when you go to sell stock, you, you need to come up with the value of what that stock is. And so not having to give a value early on might be a good thing because you may want to build your company up a little bit more maybe you know get to the point where you've got more technology got more value have more assets maybe have revenue coming in and then at that point come up with the value because hopefully likely the value will be a lot higher if you wait and assess it at that point rather than very early on before you have any of that stuff and obviously the more value you have the better it's going to be for the company um, so that's one of the pros the convertible note or the safe uh, instrument or agreement, they're usually generally much easier to document than if you're going to go sell stock. In your typical VC financing, there is a suite of documents that you need to negotiate and um, and get uh, finalized and executed. That takes time. They're lengthy. They're, they're detailed. We'll go into some of that a little bit later. But having a document that's much shorter, much easier to put in place and negotiate with investors gets you money that much quicker through the door so that you can use it much quicker. And then again, you avoid the valuation and, and put off some of the other stuff until later on when you are ready to actually sell your stock and do a price equity round. And of course, it's less expensive. So, you know, to do a convertible note um, versus, you know, or a safe versus a, a full fledged VC financing is going to be a lot less expensive. So much easier given the startup, if you have a limited budget early on, much easier to, to, uh, to manage. Some of the cons, <clears throat> at least for convertible notes, if it's a convertible note, it's a note, it's debt. So now you've got debt that's going to be reflected on the financials of the company. It is debt, so it has to be repaid at some point in time. On a convertible note, you will see a maturity date, the date when that debt needs to be repaid. Having said that, though, most investors that are um, putting money in for a convertible note do not expect, do not want to get repaid the principal and interest. That's not what they're looking for. They're really looking for an opportunity to get in early to negotiate the ability to convert their um, the principal and interest into shares at a future date at some sort of a discount. So they get they get a better deal than if they just waited and bought shares when you do your price to equity round. So it's attractive for them. It's it's good for the company too, but just be aware it is debt. And if you know there are some circumstances where if the company can't raise around and it's been a year or two or whatever the time period is, uh, depending on what the agreement says, the the holders of the note, those investors could come back and say, okay, you didn't raise, we didn't convert, you need to repay us the money. So something to be aware of. It doesn't happen very often, but it certainly is something that could be done. They, I call it an extra liquidation preference. Um, if they're loaning money to the company in a convertible note, then they are creditors and creditors get paid first before you can pay shareholders. So debt gets paid before before you can pay any of the equity holders. So it's good for the investors because they're going to get paid out first if, if the company has to liquidate, close down. Um, you know, for the company, just being aware that 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 money needs to go to them first before it can go to other shareholders if the company is, is going to be uh, closing down or or dissolving. Um, next slide, please. 
So a little more on, on convertible security. See, these are some of the typical terms you'll see. You know, maturity date is when it's when it's due, when you have to repay the principal and interest, the interest rate in order to be a, a loan, a note. It, it has to include some sort of interest rate. Interest rates, you know, typically are, are generally pretty low. Obviously, now in, in, in the current economy, in the current landscape, we've seen a hike of interest rates by the Fed. So, you know, obviously the interest rates on convertible notes that we're seeing now are typically a little bit higher than what we've seen in the past. Um, you typically have to set your interest rate at the very lowest. You have to follow what the, the feds tell you is the lowest rate you can charge the applicable federal rate. And so those have obviously gone up, um, you know, over the year or two. So uh, you will see an interest rate on notes. You'll see conversion terms. You know, what are the terms and the mechanisms for when the convertible note converts into stock? That's going to be important. The amendment terms, this is one that is important to pay attention to. If you do a bunch of these, if you go out and raise, you know, a million, two million on convertible notes, um, you know, how can those notes be amended? And oftentimes, if it's just one note, it's the company and the, the person that holds the note both need to agree to some sort of amendment. But if you've got 10 notes out there, and let's say the, the, the maturity date was coming due, you issued them today, and the maturity date you set it for whatever reason, December 31st of this year, doesn't give you a long time to do your next your financing where there, those notes will convert. So if you're coming up on that maturity date, the last thing the company wants is suddenly you hit December 31st and everyone calls you that has a note saying, hey, you know, great, enjoyed the ride. Now repay me my principal and interest. And you're looking at your financial saying, I'm a startup, guys. I don't have the money. I can't repay you. So you may want to extend the maturity date. So you to do that, you've got to amend the agreement. But if you've got 10 or 15 of these notes out there, do you have to go to every single one of those 10 or 15 note holders to get their consent? You can include a provision in the convertible note that says, look, as long as we get a majority in interest to amend, then we can amend certain terms, including, for example, the maturity date. So that's an important um, thing to be thinking about. The remaining terms, you know, not a, typically a lot of negotiation on those, some reps and warranties and covenants and things like that. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but just know that these are some of the basic terms you'll see in a convertible note. These don't apply to safes, by the way, which we'll talk about in a moment. Next slide, please. So other topics on convertible notes, um, mandatory conversion uh, at a discount price, you know, pay the next qualified financing. So essentially, as I mentioned, they're designed to convert into shares when you do your next financing and, and you typically want to make sure you've got a good definition of what that next financing is, at which time those notes will convert into equity. You, you don't want to leave it open ended and you can, but oftentimes we'll see a defined term. So, for example, you have to raise at least a million dollars by selling preferred stock. And at that point, that triggers that that's the definition of next qualified financing that then triggers a conversion and they'll convert at that point. <clears throat> um, oftentimes you'll see a discount or a conversion price cap or valuation cap. And essentially what this is, I'm not gonna to spend too much time going into it, but it's, they're getting some sort of a, a, of a sweetheart deal in the sense that when the note converts, it's gonna convert at a discount to what the investors in that financing are gonna be paying for their stock. So for example, if you're doing a discount, a 20% discount, and when you get to your next qualified financing, you're gonna sell preferred series or let's say series A stock at a dollar a share, they're going to be able to buy it for 80 cents a share. They're going to get a 20% discount off of that dollar. So for them, it's a good deal because they're going to end up buying it uh, cheaper than the other investors. There's a concept called valuation cap, which essentially does the same thing. It'll give them, it'll give the note holders the ability to buy more shares by applying the valuation cap. And it's it's a way to basically say, we're going to establish what the valuation cap might be now. Let's say it's 5 million. And if you go to your next qualified financing, and let's say at that point in time, you've come up with the value for the company of 10 million, then when you do the numbers and the equation to figure out how many shares their uh, note will convert into, you don't use the 10 million figure, you use the 5 million figure. So it's going to be less, which means it'll translate into getting more shares, which means they're getting a, a better deal because they've got this valuation cap. Um, conversion upon a change of control, if the company gets sold before um, there is an ex-qualified financing, there will be mechanisms for managing that, you know, it can convert upon certain terms. Or if the company just decides that it's liquidating, um, what happens then? There's usually provisions for that too. In some cases, you'll see optional maturity conversion. So when the note comes to maturity, instead of demanding to be repaid the principal and interest, the note holder or the company in some cases can just go ahead and, and um, elect to convert it into shares using some formula. 
Um, that's another provision you might see from time to time. Next slide, please. OK, so the topic of capitalization, <clears throat> let's talk about that for a moment. This is an important thing to be thinking about all along the, the life cycle of your company. It, it's, you know, important in the beginning because you want to make sure you're setting things up properly. But, you know, how much equity do you give? How do you allocate equity? How do you strike the right balance between, you know, parceling out equity in the company at the very early stage, i.e. amongst founders, or even as you're bringing employees on, advisors, consultants, um, how do you allocate that? So people are incentivized. They want to be productive and help the company grow, but you're also not giving out too much. So the founders end up getting diluted and having a lot less than maybe um, they might otherwise have. I always tell people, think backwards. So think about where you might be in, in three or four or five years. Think about what that might look like, what you want to ultimately have, <clears throat> or at least try to have as far as an ownership in the company, and then try to work your way backwards to figure out, okay, how do I plan for that? If I want to make sure I've still got control in a few years or, or more, um, we'll talk about that control feature with VC financing, then what do I need to do to make sure I'm not being diluted too fast, too quickly, too much, so that you know within a year now I'm kind of close to that majority ownership position? How do I manage that properly? Um, that's going to be important to be thinking about. So you know, there's sort of two pieces to that that it's important to think about is is the actual ownership. So, you know, you own 51, 50, 60, 70 percent of the company. And with that comes voting rights and the ability to make decision and, and control. Um, but also with that comes the economics. Right. So if there is a, if there is a ability to um, disperse proceeds that come in, if, if you sell the company at that point in time, you know, what are the economics going to look like if you have 70 percent versus 50 percent versus 30 percent so those two things are something you want to make sure you keep track of as you're going along the, the life cycle of the company and they'll change from time to time but understanding them at any given moment is going to be important so you can plan for it dilution will definitely happen so you just have to be aware of it anytime you issue stock anytime you grant options as a founder you you have to realize that at some point in time you're either going to get diluted immediately if you're issuing stock or you will be diluted in the future if you're issuing options. And once those options are exercised and the stock purchased, at that point in time, there'll be a dilution of what your ownership is. And of course, you know, the biggest dilution occurs when you go out and raise financing. And it's typically going to happen when you start doing your, your priced equity rounds. And now you've got VCs coming in and investing significant sums, and they're going to want a significant you know, percentage of the company. <laughs> All subject to negotiation, but oftentimes they'll have a certain amount that they're looking for. You know, it could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 percent or whatever of the company for their investment. So that chunk, once it goes out to them, obviously that's going to dilute the founders down pretty significantly. So planning for it's going to be really important. Incentivizing your team properly, just making sure that you've got employees, consultants, advisors, you're giving them what is fair, what is going to keep them incentivized to be productive, to be really engaged and work to making your company as successful as it possibly can is going to be really important. And then, of course, you know, back to the topic from the very beginning, important to have proper documentation. So make sure you've got vesting rights, make sure you've got repurchase rights so that if anyone leaves early on, I'm not talking about investors, I'm talking about specifically early personnel, advisors, employees, consultants, including founders, that if someone leaves, that the company has the right to, to repurchase those unvested shares um, without them having to take off with a chunk of the company. Next slide, please. Yeah, just really quickly, um, question come in. Uh, the the slides will be available. The link there'll be a link available to to view this. So it, uh, give us a few days, we'll get it out to you. But yeah, you'll be able to get this material as well. So some foundational basics, valuation dilution. We talked a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> this is important, you know, important early on, but it's also really important as you're getting ready for your VC financing. Understanding some of this terminology, so I'll, I'll explain it a little bit here. Uh, Pre-money valuation, for those of you who are not familiar with that means, it's basically just the value of the company before the next round of investment. So let's say you've, your company's you know, got some assets, you've got some IP, you've got, let's say it's a SaaS-based business and you've already got everything kind of ready to go. You don't have any revenue yet, but you've got technology that's been built and, and can be commercialized with some funding to be able to finish it up. <clears throat> you're going to come up with a, a pre-money valuation of the company. So what is the company worth today before your investors have put money into it? And the next term that's important is the post-money valuation, which is really it, it's the pre-money valuation 
after the round of investment. So after you've taken the money in from the investors, you know, let's say you've gone out and you've raised your VC, first VC financing and, and you raised a million dollars and the value came up pre-money valuation, let's say it was five million for the company. You took in a million dollars, your post-money valuation is now five pre-money, one million um, investment. So your post-money valuation will be six million. Issued and outstanding, um, what does that mean? If you're looking at ownership, you're looking at the cap table, <clears throat> when you want to see who owns what piece of the company today, then you look at what is considered issued and outstanding. What stock is actually issued and outstanding today? What stockholders are on the cap table? Um, that's issued and outstanding because it's actually been issued and it's currently outstanding. Someone's holding that, um, that stock. The other one term that's really important to keep track of and, and think about is what fully diluted basis, which <clears throat> is different than your issued and outstanding basis. So fully diluted means let's assume all the convertible securities have been converted into stock. So if you have specifically, oftentimes it's it's options that have been granted. That it can also include convertible notes. Um, so you take all of that and you say, let's assume everything was exercised and purchased. Everything was converted into shares. Now we've got a, a total fully um, diluted number of shares that are on the cap table. That's going to obviously be different than your issued and outstanding basis because now you've factored in all of these options that were granted because you've assumed all those options were exercised and the shares purchased. So, for example, if you had 10 million shares issued and outstanding today and you had uh, 1 million uh, shares that were options granted as options, um, if those were exercised and the shares purchased, now you've got a total number of issued and outstanding on fully diluted basis. You would assume you've got eleven. You've got um, eleven million shares versus just the ten million. On an issued and outstanding basis, it's just looking at what's issued and outstanding. So in that example, it would be um, ten million. Next slide, please. So here, here's a simple example. Um, <clears throat> Not not factoring in the option pool or any other convertible security. Um, you look at pre-money valuation of 10 million. So you've got 10 million shares that are issued and outstanding equally to three different founders. So each founder has 3,333,333 shares or 33% of the company. <clears throat> if you've got an investment coming in of 3 million at a dollar a share, so it's 10 million, right? Your pre-money valuation amount divided by the total number of issued and outstanding shares, 10 million. That gives you your post money is going to be 13 million, but that gives you your price per share of a dollar. So founder A has <clears throat> approximately 25%. They had 33% before, but when this new money came in, they got diluted down to approximately 25%. And if you do the math that you take the number of shares that they currently have, you divide it by the post money valuation amount, the 13 million, <clears throat> and then you come up with the total percentage that they have. Next uh, slide, please. So here's another example, but now we're, we're talking about convertible securities. So if you had a $450,000 convertible security with a 25% discount, then the holder would receive 600,000 um, shadow shares or shares. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, and here's the, the math. Basically, it's 450,000 divided by <clears throat> with the, the 25 cents times a dollar, that, that'll give you approximately what the, the percentage is going to be in the number of shares. So that's one example where you've got a discount. And the other example below that is where you've got the same amount of an investment in a convertible security, but now instead of doing a discount of 25%, you're giving them a valuation cap. If you remember, I told you what the valuation cap is earlier, of 5 million. <clears throat> um, so if the value of the company was 10 million and the valuation cap this person's getting is 5 million. When you do the math, you divide their investment using the 5 million um, valuation cap, they're going to end up getting more shares, 900,000 shares versus 600,000 shares if they had a discount. So the only reason I'm illustrating this is, uh, and I know I'm going a little bit quickly over this example, is I just want you to be focused on when you're going through and, and talking about issuing convertible securities where there is either some sort of discount or some sort of valuation cap, really think through. And actually, I would encourage everyone just pull out an Excel spreadsheet and run some scenarios because you can see clearly in this in this scenario, giving someone a valuation cap like this <clears throat> in this example gives them a lot more shares than if you just gave them a discount. So, you know, obviously, the more shares that are going to be issued, 
the more dilution on the founders. So as you're keeping your your focus on the dilutive impact of the founders, these are some of the decision points that are going to be important. Next slide, please. OK, so we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, we're now sort of getting into the topic of overview of venture financings. I've been sort of sprinkling in the concept of venture financing and some of the issues that are important to think about as we've been talking. But I want to kind of take a moment here and just kind of go through an overview of, of the venture capital financing so you have a better picture of what it looks like <clears throat> and what you need to have. So some of the things <clears throat> that are important is obviously you need to have a credible business plan. So think of it this way, and I'm sure all of you probably already know this and can appreciate it. The, the venture capitalists, they're in the business of investing and, and making money for their, their limited partners that have invested with them. So after a while, they're usually pretty seasoned. They usually pretty they they're usually really good at assessing sort of how a company's going to do and you know whether there's going to be a good investment or not. So you need to be able to come to them and pitch them with what is the most compelling case for why they should invest with you. So your business plan needs to be credible. It needs to be really well thought out. It needs to be really well drafted and presented and presentable. It needs to be <clears throat> concise. And you need to really perfect your pitch. So I would encourage everyone to practice it. There's all sorts of organizations where you can go and and do you know enter pitch competitions. Some of them have some some sort of prize at the end. Some don't. But the benefit is just going through that over and over and over again in front of different audiences and getting feedback. So you now have have done it 20 times, 30 times, and you've been able to anticipate a lot of questions that you maybe didn't anticipate before. And now you're able better to answer those questions. But you've also got it down so you can be very concise and direct, give them all the information they need. We'll talk about that in a moment and make it really easy for them to understand the business, the technology, <clears throat> the, the proposition. And, and really importantly, because they're looking to make, make a return on their investment, you need to be able to tell them how they're going to be able to make a return on their investment. <clears throat> the next thing that, that's really important is, is running sort of what I call a systematic process. So <clears throat> make sure you've got enough, enough capital from your earlier rounds, whether you boot, bootstrapped or you've issued convertible notes or safes or whatever the case may be, but you've got enough capital to get you through to hopefully closing your first price equity round, your venture capital financing round. Um, connect with the right investors. Um, make sure that you, you do your homework and your research on your investors. I oftentimes see founders that haven't been through the process Think of it as sort of a one-way street. Well, you know, I, I need to be able to impress them. I need to be able to, to sell them on my business. They're not thinking about, is that the right investor for me? <clears throat> They're not thinking about the other side of the street, which is, I need to interview them as well. I mean, yes, I know I need cash, so I need them more than they really need me, but you need to make sure you've got the right fit because if you're pitching to the wrong investor who's not in your space, doesn't understand your technology, you're just wasting your time because most, most likely they're not going to be the right person. But equally important is to find the right fit, you know, sort of right re relational or chemistry fit, right? You want to be working with people that you genuinely want to work with, that you um, get a sense that they really believe in you, they believe in the company, they're interested in the company. Um, that It's a relationship like anything else. So <clears throat> if you're going to be working with them, make sure it's someone that you really enjoy and want to be working with. Understand your ideal term sheet. We'll talk about that in a moment. Prepare for thorough diligence. If you haven't been through the process before, when you get to your first venture capital financing, <clears throat> that'll probably be the first time that you will go through, you know, sort of a very detailed diligence process because they're going to be asking a ton of questions. They're going to be wanting a ton of documents. They're going to be turning over every stone. And if you don't have things set up properly, they're going to be asking questions. And in some cases, if it's really messy and bad, um, that can turn off the investor and either delay closing until you clean everything up, or in some cases it might just they might just decide, look, this is just too messy. You can't run a company properly. I'm out of here. I'm not really interested. So all all the more reason to make sure you've got everything ready to go, so that the diligence process can be an e as easy and smooth as possible. Have good corporate hygiene. What do I mean by that? I really mean making sure your documents are clean. You know, if it's been a final signed document, you've got a fully executed dated document. You've got it in a format that's easy to find. You've got the name in, in a way that it's easy to see what the document is. Believe it or not, I've had some deals where we're looking at documents and, you know, they've called documents, you know, they've called an agreement, a note, or they've called a, a memo, an agreement. And, and so, you know, we have to go and open up every single file. We can't really tell what it is by the name. It just takes more time. So 
thinking about all that, how to make this as easy as possible on you, but also on the investor and the investors council. Believe it, believe it or not, it'll help smooth things over, make it quicker and, and ultimately less costly. And then be prepared for cleanup. So if you haven't done things properly and if you haven't gone through the process of having someone like your like your corporate lawyer go through and make sure you've done everything properly, then just be prepared. There may be things you need to do to clean clean up before the investor is going to be signing off on the diligence saying, yeah, everything looks good. Next slide, please. So a little bit more on the overview of, of venture capital financing. It, it all starts with obviously getting to the point where you've got an investor that's interested to sit down and talk to you. But but the real part of the process, the real transaction starts once you've got a term sheet. And whether it's a term sheet that you've prepared and presented or whether it's one that they've prepared and presented to you, making sure you understand that term sheet is, is really crucial because going back to what I said earlier, they've done this over and over and over in in, in many cases, probably hundreds, you know, if not thousands of times. So they know how to negotiate term sheets. They know all the terms. They know everything about the term sheet. And if you don't come to that meeting prepared, you're going to probably miss some things. You won't be as equipped as you could be to negotiate the best deal for you and for the company. So I always encourage people is get, get a lawyer involved for as early as possible, but definitely before you start negotiating your term sheet, because, you know, we can help you understand terms understand what's market, understand how to negotiate certain things, what's important, what's really not that important, um, and help you with that negotiation process. Believe it or not, oftentimes I've, I I get involved. They call The first time they call me is like, oh, hey, I got a term sheet I signed. We're ready to go. Can you help me? Of course, yes, we can help you. But you've already you've already negotiated a lot of these things. And if you've negotiated something that's bad, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate. We could have maybe potentially negotiated something better. Um, but we have the term sheet and, and, you know, we're working with that. So understanding your ideal term sheet. So how much the company is being sold? You know, what are the dividends that that the investors might be looking for? What sort of liquidation preferences are they going to want? Voting rights, protective provisions, which essentially are provisions that will be baked into the certificate of incorporation, the charter, if you will, that requires the company to get consent from the shareholders or certain um, series of shareholders or certain group of shareholders in order to do certain things. They're protective provisions because they're designed to protect the investor's money. So they're usually important enough events that if the company could just go willy-nilly make those decisions without getting their the investor's approval, they potentially could do something that might jeopardize the investor's investment. So for example, one of the big ticket items is selling the company. So oftentimes the VC investors coming in investing um, <clears throat> we'll want to make sure that that someone at that sort of Series A shareholding level has some say so on whether the company is going to be sold, because of course that could tremendously impact the return on their investment. So those are sort of the things that you might expect in protective provisions, optional and mandatory conversions. So keep in mind, and we didn't talk about this in a lot of detail, but there's different types of shares that you can issue in a company. The two flavors, two main flavors, are common or preferred. Preferred is a, a type of convertible security because typically the preferred will convert into common at a, at a certain point in time. Maybe it's in connection with an exit, a sell of the company or, or some other event, but it, it has a feature to convert. And, you know, you'll see in the term sheet sometimes, but certainly in the main documents, there'll be language that'll talk about can the shareholders decide to convert at any given time or is there some sort of trigger that will require the conversion of the preferred into common. Um, and, and that's usually covered and it's pretty standard, but how those terms are, are drafted can make some difference. Anti-dilution protection. Is there something in the documents in the term sheet that talks about the investors having the ability to um, keep their level of, of uh, investment? So for example, if, if you've got a VC that invests and they're getting 10% and they want anti-dilution protection, do they have rights to then be able to maintain that 10% if you go out and issue more securities in the future? I mean, that's one type of anti-dilution protection. There's other other um, ways anti-dilution protection can get um, built into the documents and the agreements. Um, and there's oftentimes, for example, if, if you go out and sell shares at a lower price point than you sold to this, this particular VC investor, then there's a mechanism in the agreement that says, well, then you got to basically offer uh, either to go back and and um, give them more shares to account for that that uh, lower price that you're selling now, or an opportunity to buy more shares, and, and to basically make sure that they're not being unduly diluted, it gives us some protection. 
Vesting for founders, as I mentioned early on, they're going to be looking at whether or not the founders stock is vested so that the founders will be sticking around for a while. They don't just jump ship once the money comes in. Um, documentation is key. They're going to be looking at that. So <clears throat> that'll be part of the diligence process. Attorney's fees. Oftentimes in the term sheet, you'll see what the investor expects the company to pay for their legal fees. It's usually capped at a certain amount. Um, depends on the round and, and how complicated it is. But, you know, you want to pay attention to that. You know, that sometimes can be negotiated. Um, but that's something that company is going to have to pay. So just be aware, not only do you have to pay your own attorney's fees, but oftentimes you'll have to pay the fees of the, the lead, in, usually the lead investor, up to a certain amount. No shop and confidentiality provisions. Essentially, that's where there is some exclusivity. You can't go out, once you've signed a term sheet that has a no shop or exclusivity provision, you can't go out and, and start shopping to sell a company or, or do something that would impact their ability, the, the investor you've been talking to, its ability to, to invest in the company on the term sheet um, terms you guys have been discussing and agreed upon. Confidentiality, that, that's another provision. Usually you'll see the no shop confidentiality and maybe a couple of other provisions will be binding versus the rest of the term sheet will be non-binding. So, you know, you don't typically want to have a, a fully binding term sheet because there's terms in there that are not fully flushed out. And that's where you go to the definitive agreements where those, doc those documents will provide all the details for the transaction. You don't have time to put all that into the term sheet because then your term sheet would you know be hundreds of pages so you do sort of very concise short summaries of the of the main terms and then the definitive agreements out the details so you don't want to have a a binding term sheet on a lot of those provisions because they may change they're going to be subject to a whole bunch of other um issues and details and diligence but what you do want to make sure at least from the investor standpoint the investor wants to make sure that the, if there's a no shop that there is a no shop that you can't just go down the street and try to work a better deal and come back and say, yeah, I'm not going to do this with you because I found someone that can do a better deal and give me a better investment. For the company side, what's really important is, is the confidentiality. So, you're, you know, once you sign the term sheet, that's when diligence starts. You're going to be opening up a data room, giving access to a whole bunch of documents. Some of that may be sensitive or confidential. And you want to make sure that at that point there is confidentiality so that that investor knows that they can't just go and then, you know, open that up to someone else or disclose it. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's going to be an important provision to be binding. And then other issues that come up, whether or not the investor is going to get a board seat on your on your board of directors or whether they're going to have observer rights. An observer is basically someone that can sit in at board meetings, get access to the information that typically is provided to the um, board members, but they don't have a vote. They're actually not. They don't have any sort of say so. They're just there to observe. They can offer input and, and advice, but they're not, they don't actually have a vote as a director does. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so when we talk about the, the documents involved in a venture capital financing, uh, we talked about the term sheet. There'll be the diligence process that starts right once the term sheet's signed. You want to be prepared for that. If you're on the company side, make sure you've got everything ready to go before you ever sign the term sheet. Because once the term sheet's signed, you know you want to basically drive to to getting your your transaction closed as quickly as possible. You know it may take 30 days, it may take 60 days, in some cases longer. But you know a, a decent range for a typical, not overly complicated transaction series seed series A, you can anticipate anywhere from about 30 to 60 days. Um, give or take. But in order for that to go smoothly, make sure everything's ready. You've got a data room that's set up. The documents are organized. They're organized in a way that investors would typically want to see them. Um, oftentimes, the, the setup of the data room is done in conjunction with a list that is sent to you from the investor or investor's counsel called a due diligence request list. It's basically a request for a whole bunch of information and documents. And it's usually itemized <clears throat> and it's pretty detailed. So if you haven't set up your data room, once you get that list, that's a good time to set it up, because if you set it up exactly the way that they're asking for documents, then it's super easy for them to go in, check the box to see what they reviewed and, and, and go through that process a little bit quicker. On the documentation side of things, <clears throat> I mentioned there's a suite of documents that typically a VC uh, deal will have. You can find really good model forms at the website that's that's listed under NVCA. So it's the National Venture Capital Association. It's a trade organization that was created a number of years ago, really designed to help the investment community, both investors, uh, the lawyers, and the company and their lawyers. 
So they've created over the years a, a really fantastic set of model documents that essentially is used in almost every deal. I mean, if I had to pin a percentage on it, I'd probably say 85 plus, maybe 90 percent of the venture capital financings done in the U.S. are done using these model forms. So that's oftentimes the first starting point when you when you start a deal is those are the documents you'll go to. You'll pull them down from the website and you know, update them and then start negotiating and tailoring them for your particular deal. Um, so that's a really good resource. There is another set called Series Seed, which is available at that website there, seriesseed.com. They're shorter, a little bit more truncated, don't include as many of the provisions. They were designed essentially for smaller rounds where you didn't want the full-blown NVCA style documents, but still wanted to make sure you've got a set of documents that can be appropriate to use for a venture capital type financing. Don't see that too often occasionally, but, but not as, as common. And then proprietary forms. So oftentimes law firms will have their own forms that they've created over time, whether they're based on the NVCA model or whether they're based on the series seed or some other form. Um, you'll see those from time to time as well. <clears throat> the pre-closing process is, is sort of everything that comes into play before the closing. Everything that needs, needs to happen, all the consents that need to be obtained from the board, from the stockholders, are there other stakeholders that you need consent from? Do you, you have everything, you know, the documents are ready? Are there ancillary documents that need to be put into place? All of that is, is what I typically look at the pre-closing and making sure you've got all that done. And, and if there's anything that's going to take time, that you make sure you plan for it in advance so you're not, you know, delayed because you needed to get something done as a, as a pre-closing item that you waited to the last minute to do. Closing essentially is when all the documents are done, the investors have signed, the company is signed, everyone's ready to close and wire funds <clears throat> and everything that's that's required for closing has been taken care of. And then essentially the closing happens when documents are exchanged, signatures, and the, the wiring of the funds takes place. Um, then you can consider the deal closed. And then there might be some post-closing items, notices that need to be provided to shareholders of actions. If particular shareholders didn't vote on a transaction, um, there may be, that well, there'll be securities filings that need to be taken care of as well, which typically the attorneys will handle. And there could be some other post-closing items that uh, either the company needs to take care of or the investors require be done after um, closing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I know we're almost at the hour. So let's talk a little bit about getting investment ready. <clears throat> you know, looking at sort of uh, preparation as being a really key component here, getting yourself investment ready well in advance is going to be tremendously helpful for you. <clears throat> So again, I'm repeating a little bit of what I said earlier, but making sure you've got clean company records, documented, signed, dated, um, everything stored in a data room or easy to access, it's named appropriately. Make sure you've got proper documentation order. So you've got all your CIIAAs or PIIAs, as you remember from earlier, those acronyms, confidentiality, invention assignment agreements. You've got your vesting agreements, your stock transfer um, restriction agreements in place. Um, <clears throat> you've got a cap table that's really important. Make sure you've got a cap table. There are great cloud-based um, uh, companies that provide cap table services. There's a whole bunch of them. Card is one that's very well known. Um, there's Astral, there's a number of others. So find one of those. I oftentimes recommend doing it because it's easy. It's electronic. You don't need to worry about printing stock certificates. You get everything, all the data up into those programs. And those programs will then, you'll be able to go in and print out a cap table. You know, oftentimes you can run models. You can do 490 evaluations. <clears throat> you can easily go then and issue stock, issue warrants, issue um, options. It makes it really easy uh, to manage the cap table. And there's a lot of other bells and whistles a lot of those companies have that they provide too. So uh, certainly worth checking out. Set up a data room. <clears throat> so oftentimes for our clients, when we when we have a client that asks us to help form the company or, or wants to do a round, oftentimes we'll create a data room for them. We have our own data room style that we use and we organize it in the way that we've seen over the years. Investors are typically looking at how things typically are organized. So it makes it very easy. And then we upload the documents as we're working on stuff. So generally speaking, the, the data room is in a pretty good current um, position. So then when you get to do a financing, it's very easy. We double check it, make sure it's updated, and then it can be turned open to uh, investors. Um, create and maintain information that will be needed for investors, diligence. So just understanding the kind of things that investors are looking for. We've kind of covered most of that um, so far, but just being aware of those documents and how important they are, making sure they're there, easy for investors to, to be able to review. 
and then becoming familiar with the NVCA uh, model uh, forms, because more likely than not, when you get to do your first financing round, those are the, the forms you're going to be starting with. So, you know, take some time, read them, understand them, ask questions. The more familiar you are as a founder or uh, if you're on the management team of a company, the better because it'll be that much easier to work with your attorneys to make sure you run through all the, the process appropriately. Uh, it'll be really, really helpful. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'll take a couple more minutes and then we should still have plenty of time for questions. So this is sort of a mantra you hear a lot from, from corporate attorneys, this sort of ABC concept of always be closing. So whatever you're doing, you know, when you've got a financing, the, the, the mantra or the mindset should be, what am I doing to get to closing? What, what am I doing today to get this deal to close? So always be closing. So do your homework, get your company's house in order before you talk to investors that we talked about, the cap table. We didn't talk too much about a performa, but essentially a performa is when you've got an investment, <clears throat> you, got a, you got a term sheet. You know, one of the things that even before you sign the term sheet, what you should do is create a performa. And it's basically you take your cap table and then you project out what that cap table is going to look like when you take on this new investment. So you can calculate the number of shares that will be issued, what the percentages will be, what the dilution is going to be for the founders and other. If you have other existing shareholders, you can figure out the dilution that's going to um, happen to them as well. But it, it's it's where you'll look to see what it's going to look like, you know, before the transaction, before the financing. But importantly, what it'll look like after you close on your financing. So it's going to be really important because not only for the company, but the investors are going to want to see that too. So that they're going to want to know that, okay, I'm putting in a million or five or 10 million. And the term sheet says, the documents say I'm going to be getting 15% of the company. Then I need to make sure that the performa is done and the calculations work out so that the number of shares that I'm going to be issued will equal that 15% or 20% or whatever they're, they're expecting. And you want to make sure that's done. It, it includes some some time to go through and make sure that the, the cells are all formulated properly. So the numbers flow, the calculations are done appropriately. That's a really critical piece because it's not anything that gets signed. It's not an agreement, but it, it's a it's a important document that everyone's going to be looking at to make sure that the numbers and the percentages and the investment amounts are all correct. Because then once you've signed off on that, those numbers are then taken and populated into the documents. So where there are numbers referenced in the documents, that that all comes from the performa, which has been fully validated and reviewed and approved by everyone who's involved in the, in the transaction. We talked about data rooms, um, doing your diligence on potential investors, make sure you know your investors, know the kind of investments they've done, know as much as you can about the VC firm, the VC, the managers of the VC firm, their experience, their knowledge, their background, but also know <clears throat> Is this is this type of investor, this VC, an investor that typically also invests in follow on rounds or, or future rounds? So it's important because, you know, you do your first round and you're going to do another round at some point in time in the future. Is the fund that put money in in your first round, are they also typically investing in subsequent rounds? And that's good to know because you then may be able to count on them on these future rounds. Um, some do, some don't. Some don't really have a, a particular um, set approach. But, you know, it's important to ask those sort of questions as well as to understand where the fund is in its life cycle, too. You know, is the fund fairly early on? Does it have a, a lot of capital left that if there was another financing round that it could invest in that round? Prepare from closing from day one. We talked about that. Create your team internal and external. So make sure as, you, as you're starting on a financing, you've got a good internal team. I mean, hopefully if, if it's just the two founders or one founder. Um, then you kind of stuck with yourself. But if you've got a little team, make sure you've got a team that's all, you know, working together, aligned. There's good communication between the in internal team and your external team, which is typically going to be your lawyers. Um, and that communication flow is done and it's consistent, you know, it's it's smooth and seamless. Set up a reasonable timeline, organize and divide tasks appropriately, make sure there's good delegation, understand who's doing what so you can process and get through and get to the closing as quickly as you can. Next slide, please. Okay, the last sort of topic, and then we'll open up for some questions, is just common pitfalls. I'm going to go through quickly on these, um, but we talked about a few of these, not setting up the entity properly, not having the proper documentation. We talked about a couple of examples where that can be sort of catastrophic. Failing to own the, the IP that's critical to the business, I gave you an example of that. Um, not having proper vesting for equity grants, I gave you a bit of an example earlier on that too, where a founder 
you know, gets 20% or 30% of the company after a couple months decides to bail and now they walk away with 30% and you're stuck because the company can't, there's no vesting. So you can't, you know, repurchase those uh, shares. Undocumented stakes in the company where you've talked about someone having a certain percentage, maybe you've given them a percentage, but then you somehow didn't translate that onto your cap table. And then it comes up later after the fact, and then it creates a big mess. Not complying with securities laws. I didn't go over this in a lot of detail, but just keep in mind that the simple um, basic um, premise here is anytime a company sells a security, issues and sells a security, whether it's stock, whether it's an option, whether it's a warrant, whether it's a convertible note or a safe, those are all typically considered securities. There are federal laws and state securities laws that need to be complied with. Because basically, the, the only way you can sell a security in the U.S. legally is if it's registered, which means, i.e., you, you went public, which no startup goes public because it's way too expensive and timely to do that. Or you get an exemption from the registration requirement where the securities laws say, look, we understand the private sector, you guys are not going to have, you know, go public to sell your stock to a small set of investors. It doesn't make sense. We want to encourage innovation. We want to allow companies to be able to grow. you got to sell equity to do that. So we're going to give you some exemptions where we're not going to require you to register your stock, but you can sell it as long as you've got an exemption, both at the federal level and then depending on where the states are that you're selling the securities to. So just making sure you're, you know, you've got your attorney there. They can guide you through the process and do the filings and all that. That's that's important. Um, not managing the cap table. We talked about that. Not having clean corporate records. Um, don't use standard boilerplate documents. Um, you know, if you're not a lawyer and experienced in this stuff, if you go to Google and, and you know, find some stock purchase agreement and you download it and use it, you know, you're you're doing that at your own peril because it may have provisions in that are they're absolutely not the right provisions, and you may be shooting yourself in the foot. Get a good lawyer that does this kind of work involved to help you. Honestly, you'll save a ton of money and headaches um, doing so. Um, I'm not going to go through the other stuff. Um, I want to make sure we open up for questions. Um, but just just remember, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. You know, for the lawyers that do this kind of stuff um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we'll help you and guide you through the whole process so you don't have to worry about it. You can focus on the business. Um, okay, so I think let's go to the next slide. Yeah, just a couple of parting thoughts. Do your homework, prepare in advance. And so let's open it up for Q&A. Um, yeah, the dream backwards is, is uh, something a friend of mine once told me, which I thought was kind of a catchy term. So you know, imagine your end goal, where you want to be. That's your vision. That's your mission. And then work backwards to achieve that. That is essentially what it means. Next slide. OK, so here are my contact, my contact information. Feel free to email me. Um, Let's, you know, if there are any questions, I know there was a bunch of questions about the recording and the slides that all that will be made available. We'll get that out as quickly as we can. Uh, my contact information is there, so if you want to reach out, um, certainly feel free to do so. Let me see. I think we've got a few questions coming up. Um, OK, so someone asked that a Canadian Canadian company looking for investors from VCs in the US. Will Canadian documents be good enough? Uh, great question. So I do see this uh, come up oftentimes where, um, and, you know, some investors, some VCs are are very experienced investing in non-U.S. entities. Um, and if that's the case and they've got that experience, then, yeah, that, that should not be a problem. You know, the good thing about Canada is is Canada and the U.S. is, is a very good relationship. So we have similar legal systems. Um, so it, it's not it's not a far stretch if the VC is familiar with Canadian um, ventures, they've invested in, in Canadian companies before, then typically it's not going to be a problem. I will tell you, though, that that some VCs in the U.S. that don't invest in, in foreign companies, they typically will want to have a U.S. company. And they will take, typically expect the documents to be U.S.-based type documents. Um, so uh, just food for thought there. Uh, okay, so views. Can you share your views on crowdfunding, crowd investing, which has become popular in the last few years? Um, yes, it's definitely become very popular. And yes, since the Jobs Act was passed and they allowed for a new type of of fundraising, crowdfunding, um, and it it has become very popular. There's been a whole bunch of companies that have been set up that they essentially help handle the whole process. Um, so. You know, I, I've seen it used and I've seen it used effectively. The one thing I'll tell you, if, if you're talking about getting VC financing in the future, some some 
of the VC firms don't like the crowdfunding. And the reason why is because when you go out to do a crowdfunding, you're basically opening up and taking investments from a, a much wider audience, if you will. So you might go out and ask for five or $10,000 checks from, or even smaller checks from a whole bunch of people, as opposed to larger checks from a smaller group. So the takeaway is anytime you've got a whole bunch of people on your cap table, a whole bunch of people that have invested money, it just increases the burden on the company because now you've got a whole bunch of stakeholders that have maybe some say so or can ask questions, can reach out with issues, more likely that someone might be upset about something. It just, you know, anytime you've got more people involved, there's more of a chance of there being issues. So for that reason, it's it's oftentimes not looked upon too favorably by, by VCs just because they know that, okay, great, I'm investing in a company that's got a huge cap table. There's two or 300 shareholders. So every time the company's going to do something, you got to be mindful of that. And if someone's got an issue because they they're not sophisticated, you know, they can raise claims and it can just be a bit of a problem. I don't want to deal with it. I want to have a smaller cap table and people that are more sophisticated like like me, the VC fund, so I don't have those issues. So that's one thought process that goes through. I've seen that be an issue with um, uh, with crowdfunding. The other thing is making sure that if you do crowdfunding, definitely make sure you do it properly. You, you need to make sure you're complying with all the securities laws. There are different things you need to do if you're doing crowdfunding versus just your traditional non-crowdfunding with regard to the exemption. So just be aware of that. Um, another question about you. So similar question about like the Canadian investment, but now with the UK and, and same answer. I mean, UK obviously is, is a, a very well-known um, place. There's a lot of investment money there, a lot of um, VC firms in, in the UK. And there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, um, investments cross-border, both UK and US. But I guess that you know the short takeaway is the same thing. If the VC funds are familiar with UK entities, then they may not they won't have any problem investing. But if they're not, then then they're going to want to see a US entity that they invest in. What are some key factors for investors to seek? Um, oh, in your startup, yeah, that's a great that's a great point, and I didn't cover that. Um, but really quickly, so think of it this way: they're they're investing to make money. That's their that's their mission. They're making money for their the people that have invested with them. They've got a return on investment. And when you think about the the numbers, the stats, so for uh, it changes, but it's anywhere from one out of ten to one out of fifteen, maybe companies that invest the VCs invest with will hit it out of the ballpark and return a huge investment. And that one or two out of ten or out of fifteen is typically what carries and makes the profit for all the other investments that don't work. So the majority of investments fail. They just don't they don't return an investment on on the the uh, they don't return an investment for the investor. So given, given that, they need to be really selective and really need to know that the company is one that can scale and grow and, and be a, a sizable company with enough value so that if it isn't a, a candidate for an exit, you know, an acquisition or, or for a, a going public, that it's going to be able to do so and be successful at it. So it's got to be a scalable type of business. The other factors that are key that you look at is they obviously look at um, the technology. It's got to be technology that's going to be commercialable that that can get out there and can you know solve some sort of need that people. There's going to be a market for it. And the market needs to be big enough, but it's the kind of technology that can service that and 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 solve that solution. You know, provide that solution for that need. The other key is is a management team that you know they have confidence in that's going to be able to do what is needed to be done to get the company to the next level. The initial management team may not be the management team that will be with it long term. Oftentimes it's not as a company scales and grows. It's going to get to a point in size where you need to bring in you know, people that are that are used to managing, have a lot of experience managing a larger enterprise. <clears throat> um, it's very different managing a company that's got 10 or 20 employees versus a company that's got 400 or 500 employees. So you need to bring those skill sets in. But it is crit critical. They're going to be looking at the founders looking at the, the management team that you have in place and making sure that they're the kind of team, the kind of people that they want to invest their money in and work with. Because just like you should be looking at them as, hey, is this investor someone I want to work with? Do I enjoy them? Do I enjoy working with them? Uh, they're going to be doing the same thing. And if they they like you, they get a good feeling about you, you're easy to work with, that goes a long way towards uh, their decision making. Okay, so let's... Um, okay. Okay. What pro forma projections are expected to reach a Series A investment? Um, 
So if you're talking about sort of revenue, what what is typically looked at by VCs for sort of your typical Series A or, or what what gets them interested in your company? If on the revenue side, if you can get to one million in annual recurring revenue, that's oftentimes sort of a, a threshold that you'll see talked about with VCs. It doesn't apply to every VC because again, you need to know the investor, you need to know the VC, and you need to know what type of investments they typically make. There are some VCs that look at making very early stage investments in companies where there is no revenue. They know that and they're comfortable with that. And that's they want to get in early um, on those types of investments. There are other companies, other VC funds that want to see some sort of revenue coming in on an annual basis. So, you know, whether it's a million or two million, a million is what I typically have seen and, and heard um, around the community. So that's a good um, a threshold because then they know at least You've got you've got a million bucks coming in. You've done something right. You've got you know recurring customers that are paying for services, so that's always a good sign. That's that's one of the things that I'll see. Um, <clears throat> crowdfunding investors usually act as a, as one single person at the cap table. I thought no. Well, so if you're going to do crowdfunding, basically what you do is oftentimes it, there, so there's companies, not lawyers. Lawyers do it too, but there are companies you can go to and say, hey, I want to do crowdfunding. And they've got a whole platform designed to help you with your crowdfunding. So what they do is they get you all the information, they gather all the information, you get all the documents in place, you upload them to their platform, and then they can go ahead and, and send it out or send out notices and do the mailings and the, and the general solicitation, the advertising, if you will. And then the investments come in, but it's going to be investments from, from a whole bunch of different people. They're going to be individual investors or entities that are investing but they're all going to be investing and buying a, a piece of, of the company. They're going to be getting shares. So it's not it's not typically one person. It's it's a whole bunch of people. Now, there may be another circumstance where you go out to a company that was set up kind of like a VC fund, right? A VC fund is, is essentially it's a company that was set up. You you get a whole bunch of, of individuals that invest in the fund and then the fund goes and invests that money into a startup. Um, but the, the typical one that I've seen is is where the crowdfunding is you go out to a whole bunch of people and they all send you checks and they get, you know, small pieces of, of the company. So you end up with a larger cap table. Um, OK, so here's something that looks like I'm not looking at questions posted on Q&A. OK, so let me look at the Q&A. So there's a bunch of questions that were posted in the chat. And I'm looking at the q and I don't see anything in the Q&A, but oh, here we go. OK, let me run through some of these two. So what happens if an investment fails? Would the founders receive a lawsuit? Um, I mean, potentially, I mean, that, that's a really open ended question. I don't know you know, the reasoning why it failed. If if the founders took the money and went on vacations and spent the money or were really um, making bad, you know, negligent decisions, defrauding the company, doing something bad where they could be held accountable, then yes, they could certainly be sued. But generally speaking, if if they used good efforts, if they discharged their duties properly, they made the best decisions at the time with the information they had, tried to do right by the company, and the company just didn't succeed, then yeah, the, the there can always be filed, there can always be a lawsuit filed, but typically the founders as as individuals will be shielded because they've set up the corporation that provides this liability protection, that provides a shield. The only time they can be sued individually is if they stepped outside of their role. Um, as let's say as a director and officer and did something that was outside and beyond of what they should have been doing, or they engage in something where they could be personally held responsible, like engaging in fraud or doing something along those lines. <clears throat> um, important point with that, though, is oftentimes you'll want to make sure you get um, director and officer insurance, errors and emissions insurance to cover scenarios where individual board members or officers could be sued. Um, there is insurance. It's, it's generally not too expensive. Um, Someone posted something saying it's too expensive for small companies. I totally disagree. We do that all the time. You're not typically looking at a huge amount. It could be a couple thousand dollars a year, but it could be money well worth it. Um, and small companies do have boards. I mean, if you set up a corporation, you have to set up a board. You cannot have a corporation, at least in the U.S., without a board of directors, because the board is what sort of manages overall the, the company. And then the officers manage a sort of day to day. They're the management team, if you will. Um, <clears throat> Um, OK, so how does it work if co-founders decide to adjust or redefine their equity ownership in the company since it was 50-50 when, when they founded the company? 
Um, th that's a discussion they're going to have to have. I mean, if if the company was set up as a 50-50 and somewhere along the line they wanted to make a change to it, then you know they're going to need to figure out what that change is. And there's probably a couple of ways that could be done. You know, one founder could could transfer some of his or her shares to the other founder to equalize it to the point where they want it to be, or the company could issue additional securities or equity to that one founder that's supposed to get more. It'll dilute the other founder, so that's another way of doing it. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it, um, but yeah, it certainly can be done. Okay, so I didn't see any, I saw those questions in the q and I didn't see anything else. Let me go back to the chat. Um, okay, so, All right, there's a bunch in the, in the chat. Let me see if I can run through these in the next 10 minutes. Um, okay, we are a SaaS-based ecosystem company from India, building in the market space, um, marketing space. We outreached 100 plus US investors and got less than five responses. We were looking at 100 to 500 seed round. Can you give some input on improving the reply? Any resource or specific process you recommend? Um, that's that's a really good question, and, and you know, happy to kind of talk with you offline about that. I think, you know, looking at sort of the the basics of, you know, what's your approach been? Who are you reaching out to? Um, are you, is your, is your slide deck um, set up in a way that it's as attractive as possible and it gives all the information that investors are going to want to see? Investors in the U.S., maybe a different perspective in India if you're, if you're talking to in, um, investors in India. But for the U.S. market, there's sort of a, a rhyme and, and, and rhythm and in, in how you present information. So, making sure you're doing that in a way that is most receptive to um, to investors here in the U.S. would be a good thing. Um, the other thing to be aware of, and I won't go into too much detail, but you know, <clears throat> just be careful and, and talk to a lawyer about how you go about looking for investments. If you go out to a whole bunch of people that you don't know, don't have a relationship with, and you start asking them for money to invest in your company, you now could have actually engaged in what's considered a general solicitation, which is governed under the securities laws. And you can't do that unless you've got a proper exemption and know how to do that. So i.e. like a crowdfunding, which allows you to do some advertising and some sort of general solicitation, but it's done in a way that's compliant. If you're not complying with the securities laws, you can get yourself into some trouble. So just be aware of that. Um, but definitely work with a, a, a lawyer who understands that. <clears throat> Any advice on pushing back on unfavorable terms by investors? Um, well, I, I think the best way to do it is just come as prepared as you possibly can. <clears throat> you know, investors are, are they're typically sharp. They, they know the terms. They know the you know investments. And so you're generally speaking going to be at a disadvantage because that's their world um, that they live in every day. So how do you counteract that or how do you sort of equalize that playing field? The way you do it is just by being as, po as, as prepared as you possibly can be before you go in to discuss, negotiate a term sheet or, or, or any of the agreements. So a couple of things is do your homework, read, 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 talk to people, get advice. But before you go in to actually negotiate anything, get get a good lawyer that understands these types of deals, is, works with startups, works with VC financing to help you. Because, you know, you can read everything you want and spend a ton of time doing it. But again, if you're not doing this every day like the lawyers are, you, you're just not going to understand it, that that sort of depth of level that you need to. So doing a lot of yourself to prepare and also understanding and getting help from lawyers. So to your specific question, though, is once you've got all that information, now you've got all the arrows in your quiver, if you will, so that when somebody fires out a, an objection or pushes back on a particular provision you want, you've done your research, you, you can answer it. You can say, well, actually, that is a that's a market term. That's a term that's pretty consistent with the market, or that's a term that's consistent with the market for health tech companies or med tech companies or whatever the case may be. You can provide a response that's intelligent, <clears throat> Is is backed up by some some basis of experience, whether it's you or your attorney or you know you've got some ability to 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 hold on that position. And investors will respect that. They may not agree ultimately, but in some cases they'll they'll respect that, and you'll be able to negotiate those terms. Um, could you talk about trying to reach capital before you have a revenue? What types of forecasting VCs expect? I touched on this a bit. I mean, some some VCs will not invest in a pre-revenue company. It's just not their model. They don't like it. They don't do that. But there are plenty of investors that do. I mean, we've done a ton of investments with companies early stage that had no revenue. So there's a lot of lot of investment firms out there that invest in pre-revenue. So if if it's pre-revenue, then excuse me, what you need to sell them on and what you really need to get their interest on is we've got no revenue, but we've got great technology. We know the market. 
we know there's there's a fit in the market for our technology and it's it's a really it's going to be a, a big place that we can play in this market and we can generate revenue that'll be substantial that will then return the investment on your uh, return uh, investment on your investment to you know to a large extent so you you can convince them that i mean again they'll know the technology if they know the industry and if they play in your space they'll know it so they'll be able to get it quickly you just need to explain it to them the revenues are not there, but but so what? The revenues will be there. What you've got is you've got technology that solves a pressing need, and there's a great market, and it's it's the type of technology and company that can scale and grow large and end up returning an investment for the uh, VC. Um, what kind of salary payment should I set up for my company, and how high is a good rate? Uh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's hard to say. It varies by industry to industry. It varies by, by uh, geography. So, what someone may may be able to pay themselves in San Francisco or Silicon Valley may be very different than what you might expect um, could be paid to someone in Alabama or, or Nebraska or one of the other states where the cost of living is a lot less. So, you have to kind of look at what's market in the area in which you're going to be working in, and then you also need to balance that against, you know. Right now, the company needs money, and the money needs to be used to develop the technology, develop the product, develop the service, whatever it is you're creating. So I need to be able to put as much of that towards developing the company because, you know, if I pay myself, as soon as money comes in the door, if I start paying myself a lot, then there's less money to, to build the company. And that's always a, that's a, that's a tension point that almost every startup deals with unless it's independently funded and, and you know, you've got enough to bootstrap it. Um, so you just need to balance that out. I mean, giving yourself some salary to make sure you can, you know, continue to work and don't have to be stressed out, but making sure you're, you're preserving enough for the company to be able to grow um, until you get your funding that can really accelerate the growth is going to be critical. Um, so there are there are resources you can reach out to to kind of get what wages are in different areas and in different industries. I would encourage you to do some research there and find out. That'll give you a decent sense of sort of salary metrics, if you will. And then you can kind of peg it to that, maybe down a little bit from that, given that you're early stage and don't have the resources yet to pay the full amount. OK, we got a couple more minutes. Um, let me see how many more I can get through. Um, yeah, so one one comment coming in, we're launching an AI med tech. We do a ton of work in the AI space and the med tech space. So yeah, reach out to me. I would love to talk with you um, uh, privately. Typically, out of every 1,000 companies pitching for VC money, get funded. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that stat, but I kind of gave you what you know. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, you're you're it's a competition, so that's why you need to make sure everything's honed. It, it's the pitch is really well rehearsed and and presented, and it hits all the topics that the VCs are interested in. Um, I have several projects, uh, web applications. Would you say it's okay to have them all in one entity, or would it be uh, beneficial to set up in different entities? I get this question a lot, actually, and <clears throat> what I oftentimes say is, if it's if it's all the same type of business you're doing, maybe it's a little bit different here and there. But if if it's all going to be related to the same thing, then then maybe it makes sense to have it under one one company, because investors are going to be looking at that, right? So if you've got a company that is doing essentially the same type of business, maybe it's some nuances, differences, but you set up one in one company and you've set up the other type of service that's very similar in another company. And then you go out for company A to raise money, but you've got this company B, you're going to have to disclose that you've got another company that's doing something very similar because it's potentially competitive and the investors are going to want to know that. So as soon as you tell the investors that, they're going to say, well, if it's so similar, why is it in why is it not in the same company? I want to invest in one company that's going to be able to grow. This is a similar enough business. Why isn't it in the same company? You may get that kind of um, question from the investor. So if it's if that's the case, I'd probably say have it in one company. If it's if it's different enough. So for example, one business is really a service business. It's a consulting business that you have, and then you've got another company that you're building, which is technology based. That's going to offer a technology solution um, that doesn't provide the consulting piece. That may be a scenario where it's okay to separate out the company. So you can continue to run your consulting business, grow that, drive revenue from it, so you can pay yourself a salary and all that. Whereas the other company that's got the technology could then grow and scale and take on investment dollars. And that may not be enough of a of a conflict or competition that the investors are going to be worried about. It's a case by case basis, but that's at least a good example where I've seen a, a division of two different companies um, be done and and been acceptable to uh, investors. What's the best approach for an entrepreneur to take in the given market? Um, huh, great, great question in today's market. So be patient. 
deals are taking longer. The diligence is, is taking, I don't know that I'd say it's taking longer, but investors are being more careful in their investments. They're taking more time to look uh, a little bit more in depth at the companies they're investing. And just, just because of the fact that there's been some rather notable newsworthy debacles and implosions of companies where maybe there wasn't as much diligence as there could have been or things were missed and, and suddenly it turns out that the company imploded and, and had the investors known they maybe wouldn't have invested. And I think that makes the investment community always a little bit um, more careful. So I think you can expect diligence to be a little bit more in depth, maybe take a little bit longer, maybe more information requested, um, deals taking maybe a little bit longer to close, maybe investors being a little bit more careful and selective with uh, companies they invest in. So whereas before, maybe, you know, two out of 10 or two out of 50 or whatever investments they would make, um, maybe there's a little bit less now or, or maybe the, the, the metrics are a little bit different. So just being a little bit more careful in the investments they're making. Okay, so I think I answered all the questions. Um, if I missed any, please reach out to me separately. We'd be happy to to chat with you. We're a minute over 1030. I know it's an hour and a half, so it's a long day for everyone to take out an hour and a half to, to listen to this presentation. So thank you. I, I, I'm very grateful for the fact that everyone joined. Hopefully the information that I provided was helpful. If you have any follow-up uh, comments, questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. You've got my name and my email there. And uh, would happy to would be happy to chat with you if there's anything we can do to help you. Would be happy to do that as well. So thank you very much. I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your day, afternoon, evening. And uh, I will be doing other other presentations on on different topics as well. So stay tuned. I'm sure there'll be some other ones that I'll be giving um, shortly. Thank you so much. Take care.